what are we talking about here? Well, it really starts with this guy, a Horace Mann. So Horace Mann grows up in Boston at a time where there is this tremendous tension between Catholics and Protestants. And he makes it his life's mission to create a more tolerant, civilized society. So he gets on a boat with his wife, and he goes to Prussia. And when he gets there, he sees this. One teacher and about 30 or so kids in a room. And he says, aha, I've seen it. I've seen the future. This will solve the problem I'm trying to solve. He brings it back to Massachusetts. We adopt the first compulsory education law in the U.S. And this becomes the blueprint for why we do K the way we do K-12 today. It was designed to solve a different problem. Now, since 1843, we've made a few advances in, in our society. We've gone from the stagecoach to the jet airplane. We've gone from the telegraph to the smartphone. We've gone from antiquated medicine to high-tech medical equipment. But we have not evolved when it comes to how we deliver education today. And if there's one thing that we know today that I'm sure Horace Mann didn't know back in 1843, it is how hard it is to differentiate instruction. And I'm sure the same is true in the U.S. and Brazil and all around the world. I'm a former fifth grade math teacher. I had students in my class on a second grade level and students in my class on an eighth grade level. I was told, Mr. Rose, meet every kid where they are. Okay, got it. Mr. Rose, here's the fifth grade curriculum. Go teach it. Okay. Well, how exactly am I supposed to, oh, just do your best. And that's kind of the design flaw in the Horace Mann vision. In my class, I had one student who was shy, who hated to work in groups, but who loved technology. One who wanted lots of attention, but hated to handwrite. One who was out of the country for three years, not in any school. One who read books that were three grade levels ahead, but didn't want to look like a nerd. One played hours of video games every night instead of doing homework. One, a talented artist who needed to see things visually to understand them. One who was two years ahead in math, but a year behind in reading. And one who loved to apply math concepts to sports. I know the teachers in the room have these kids in their class as well. How do we possibly expect one teacher to personalize learning, given this variability in every classroom around the world? Well, our view is that if we are serious about really meeting the needs of each and every student in a class, the only way to really do that is to view live, teacher-led instruction, the kind of instruction that many of you do every single day, as one way. And it may be the best way, but it's not the only way we know kids can learn. We know they can learn collaboratively from each other in different sized groups. We know they can learn with virtual tutors that are located anywhere around the world. And we know that they can learn by themselves, either with printed materials or with software. Now, we call all these different ways of delivering instruction modalities. And by integrating all of these modalities into one single learning environment, we move from a model that looks like this, which I suspect you'd see all around Brazil and the US and all around the world, to one that looks more like this. And the reason this is so important is because in a multimodal classroom, we can contemporaneously teach multiple things. So the person, the student who's in fifth grade but operating on a third grade level can learn third grade materials. And the fifth grader who's operating on a seventh grade level can learn seventh grade materials. And what so a teach to one is, is the integration of multiple modalities of instruction into a single learning environment in order to enable personalization. Sounds, makes a lot of sense in the PowerPoint. Well, we thought it made sense too. We decided to actually put it into action. How do you sort of bring this concept to life. And here's basically how we did that. We started off with what we call the skill map, similar to what Jose was talking about. These are the discrete set of skills we want kids to know. 
we decided just for now to focus on math and see if we can make math work, and then we'd start working on other subject areas. So you can see uh, in the case of math, one of the main skills might be using equivalent fractions as a strategy to add and subtract fractions. That skill has subskills, those skills have subskills, and so on and so forth. At the beginning of the school year, we administer a diagnostic assessment to figure out what are the skills each student knows and doesn't know. We call the skills that they don't know their playlist, and no two students have the same one. You might be on a sixth grade level in algebra and a seventh grade level in geometry. You actually don't even care what grade you're in. What we care about is what you know and what you don't know so we can figure out what it is that you should learn next. With that data that we get, we can also learn a little bit through surveying of which modalities might work best for each student. So we can interview the parent, the student, the previous year's teacher, and if everyone says, wow, we think that virtual live instruction or collaborative learning might be really good for the student, that can generate a hypothesis for what types of modalities do we think would work, and we can learn a little bit about their interests, who likes sports or music or performing arts. Now this is usually the kind of information that teachers learn about over the course of a full school year, and at the end of the year, it kind of just goes poof, and the next teacher's got to figure it all out themselves. So now we know a lot about each student. The question is, if we know that Joseph needs to learn how to explain patterns, virtual live instruction might be an effective modality, and he likes sports, do we have a lesson that teaches that skill in that way, integrating those kinds of interests? And so to answer that, we need lots of content, lots of lessons. So at this point, our team has looked at over 50,000 middle school math lessons and selected what we think are the very best 12,000 from over 20 different providers. Some of those lessons are live lessons that can be delivered by teachers. Some of them are virtual lessons, some of them are collaborative, and some of them are independent. And we put data about all those lessons in our system too. This is a lesson from Pearson, teaches kids how to calculate the area of a triangle, it takes 29 minutes, you need pipe cleaners, great for kids who like music, or whatever the case may be. And so now, we have all this data about each student, and we have all this data about all these lessons. Question is, what do you do with all that data? Well, here's what we don't do. We don't say to the teacher, hey, good news, we have all this data, good luck trying to figure out what to do tomorrow. And so that's what we created, what we call the learning algorithm. And the best way to explain it is to think about what happens when you go to the airport. There may be weather problems in different cities, certain planes can only fit at certain gates. The technology organizes all this for us behind the scenes. We just look up at the monitor and we see the status of our flight, we see our gate. It's the same concept here. Our algorithm takes all the data about each student all the data about all the lessons. And with that, creates a unique schedule for each student and each teacher each day based on the lessons that are most likely to be successful for each one. They take an online assessment every day. The way it looks, and I'll show you a video in a moment, is if you're a seventh grader, you've got uh, reading, first period, in room 204. You've got PE in the gym, second period. Third period, you have math. You walk into this big open space with 13 or so stations. You look up at the monitor. You see you're going to work on area of a triangle with Mr. Smith in station one. They're going to work on area of a triangle with some software for the second part of the session. Then you take an online assessment in area of a triangle, and you're off to social studies. We take the data and create your schedule for the next day. If you did well, you move on. If not, you get the same skill but in a different way the next day. When we get this kind of data <clears throat> from our daily assessments, we're able to do a number of things. Not only can we see what, whether each student can move on, but we can also update the profile. So just like if you shop on Amazon.com, it learns more about who you are as a consumer every time you shop, we learn more about each student, and we can update the profile. Maybe virtual live instruction wasn't so good for this student. We can just take that initial hypothesis and refine it every time we learn about what works best for that one student. We can also go back 
to the content providers. And we can say, look, your lessons publisher are, your fractions lessons are doing great. We pay the providers based on how often we use their lessons. And we schedule them based on how effective those lessons are. There are some publishers that have been in business for 100 years. They have no idea that chapter 12 is great and chapter 16 is terrible. And in fact, many of the reasons why certain students have certain materials is because some publishers have an incredible lock on the distribution of that. It has less sometimes to do with quality and more to do with who's got the biggest sales force. We can actually think of us like iTunes. Instead of buying albums, we now buy songs. Instead of buying textbooks, we buy lessons. And we make those decisions based on what's working for students. And then finally, over time, as more students are involved in the system, it gets smarter. It says, OK, Maria, who likes dance and is learning about area of a triangle, I've had 50,000 students like this before. And there's a great lesson from this provider and another one from that provider and one that would be great with this teacher. So we can use the data to predict what might work best for each student. So that's the concept. Let me show you some of the results that we've started to see. Um, this was from the last year of School of One in New York City. They gave the Terra Nova assessment, which is a national assessment in the fall and in the spring. And we can compare the gains to what happens nationally. And what you're seeing in the US is a big movement around accountability, not only for teachers, but also for the providers. Are the providers helping teachers to make a difference? What we saw in the fall and the spring is a 22-point gain on, in the sixth grade level on the Terra Nova assessment from the fall to the spring. At the seventh grade level, we saw something similar, 12 points with the School of One Schools versus uh, eight points nationally. And then eighth grade, which eighth grade is the grade we focus on the most because most, we want to be sure the students are ready for high school. So we spend a lot of time in sixth grade and seventh grade filling gaps from the fifth grade, from the fourth grade, sometimes from the third grade, so that they're ready for eighth grade so that they can be ready for high school. And in eighth grade, we saw some of the most striking results, 23 points versus six points. Now, we're still learning. This is still improving. I'd say our model today is maybe 50% baked. Um, but the power of next generation models, of integrating technology in transformative ways, is becoming clearer and clearer to us. And we couldn't be more excited about what the future holds. So with that said, I'm going to show you um, about a three and a half minute video that will show you what this innovation looks like uh, when it comes to life. What we see in lots of urban schools is a wide variety of student levels. We've got schools with kids coming into middle school on a third grade level. They from different countries, they have different cultures, they speak different languages. They can be kinesthetic, they can be verbal, they can be visual learners. How do you actually teach to this diverse group of students? School of One is based on one simple idea, that we are organizing an entire school around the needs of every one student. I like the online tutor because you get to like work with different teachers from all around the world. The other day I was working with a teacher from North Carolina. Edwin, how many threes did we just have? Five. Right. I like how we get to use computers to learn math because I never did that before. There are eight different ways that students can learn and five of them are live and three of them are on computers. I like to work with other people, but not too many people. You're working with a small group of kids, one teacher and like eight, about eight kids. I like the communication with the tutor online. I get scared sometimes if I have to look at a teacher and ask them a question, but sometimes you just type the question and they answer it. At the end of the day, what happens is the students take a five question assessment. If they pass their test, they move on to another skill. When it says green, that's like a when you have a yellow, you kind of have like a down phase because you're like kind of sad and you want to achieve more because you know you could do better. When you get red on your modality, you're like, ah! If they have not passed the test, then the algorithm figures out a new way to teach the student that specific skill. As the algorithm gets smarter, as it learns the student's skills, it learns their levels, the student gets smarter. The teachers get smarter. We all grow at the same time. One of the main ideas of School of One is to have technology take a lot off teachers' plates so they can focus on doing what they came into this profession to do. 
the algorithm allows us to teach. It allows us to do what we are trained to do. It allows us to do what the Department of Education has invested in us. School of One is making me the amazing teacher that I always wanted to be. I'm grateful for that. One of the teachers overheard a student say to another student, I am smart. I'm not stupid. And it made her wonder, how long has this one student been harboring the belief that she was stupid? And the only thing that was really stupid was the way we were teaching her. Any one of these children can grow up to be anything they want to be. President of the United States, a teacher like me. But because of circumstances of birth, they don't have the opportunity. And the school of one gives them that opportunity. It levels the playing field. I love my teacher. I love the algorithm. I love when a parent comes in and says, what are you doing here? Because my daughter is doing all sorts of wild math. I'm a lot better student now. It really helps me learn faster. I love when I see a kid excited about this one connection that was just made. I love School of One. Every student in New York City is waiting for School of One. So there, as we speak, 3,500 students in the U.S. who are getting their math instruction in this see? way. Next year, we'll probably double in size. Uh, and hope over the next few years as our model gets uh, more fully baked to expand both uh, domestically and internationally. So thank you so much.